enjoyed it. And we're on the last hooray, of our three uh, weeks journey together uh, with me pretty much doing more of the talking than you. I know that's um, the way it is. Sorry about that. But uh, me sharing my heart about where the vision of the church is. What's, what is the course that we're traveling on? I believe that there is a specific calling on us from God. A specific weighty calling on us from God who created heaven and earth at this moment, at this time, for us. Okay, let's just take a moment just to recognise the weight of what I've just said. If that was true, how would you feel if that meant you? A specific calling from the creator of the heavens and the earth who knows beginnings and ends and is going to restore all things in Christ. But for us here, right now, a specific calling on us. That makes me excited. That makes me nervous. That makes me uh, determined. It it makes me all kinds of things. But what does it... uh, Isn't that amazing if that is true, that there is a specific, that we're not just drifting through, that this isn't just luck, that this is that there is a purpose for us being us here in this place, in Bath, in Twerton, in St. Michael's, right now in 2013. Wow. Wow. The question that that begs is, if if there is a specific calling, what is it? (laughs) And how can we get involved? I mean, wouldn't it be terrible if we find out at the end of the story, at the end of our story, that there was a specific calling and that somehow we'd missed out on it? I'd be gutted. I'd be devastated if that was the case. So the the drive of these last three weeks is for us to make sure that we are in step with God, with the Spirit, that we are walking with him. Do you remember the, 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 the pillar of fire that went with Moses? Moses said to God, if you don't go with us, there's no point. There is no point, unless you're with us, we might as well give up now. It's the same for us, isn't it? And there's this question hanging over me. If not us, because God loves loves Twerton with a passion. He loves every single member of the people, of the group, of the community, of the families, of the, whether they're fully able-bodied or whether they're disabled, whether they are in are kind of, uh, kind of high flyers or whether they are really struggling, whether they are in secure families or insecure families, whatever background they have, whatever colour they are, God loves every single one of them, whether they're male or female, young or old. Don't, don't we believe this? Now, he wants to draw them closer to himself and his arms are reached out. He's looking like a father down the end of the line, waiting for his prodigals to come home. Waiting, longing, aching, for these people, and he sends out workers. Jesus said, pray one thing, pray one thing, ask God, the God of love, to send more workers into the harvest field, because the harvest is ready, the harvest is ready, so send more workers. Ask him to send more desperate people, more anxious people, more more excited people who are anxious for the right thing, not worried about what they look like, about what they uh, sound like, about their wealth, but anxious for the kingdom of God. Seeking the kingdom of God above all things. Is this making sense to you? Is this where your heart is? Is this where my heart is? And I want to be amongst others who share this heart. The first week I said... Uh, maybe this is a message to us right at the moment that there is a call to serve. Serve the, thr- the king. Serve the throne that we have worshipped at this morning. There is only one Lord, Jesus, and we serve this risen, ascended Lord. And if he is Lord, we are not Lord. Let's just, let's just get that straight to start with. If he is God, we are not God. Now, uh, actually, that's quite good news for most of us because being God... Is quite hard work. Being responsible for a lot of stuff in life is quite exhausting. And sometimes it's really good to have someone else who is God instead of us. And in fact, most people who come to God are pleased that they are no longer having to be God. There are some people who still want to be God. And they are not so pleased about Jesus being Lord. You with me? 
Now, sometimes that's associated to wealth. Some people who have lots of wealth are quite keen to be lord over their wealth. They are not so keen to let God be God. But poorer people who don't have so much problem with handing over their wealth because they haven't got very much of it, are happy to let God be God. That's why it's easier for a poor person to enter the kingdom, the domain of God's rule, than a rich person. And apparently it's as hard as a camel getting through the eye of a needle. Why? Because there's an authority thing going on here. Someone is Lord. Money or God. Now for us, it may not be money or God. For us, it may be status or God. It might be purpose or God. It might be my self-identity or God. It might mean my pleasure or God. But Jesus is Lord. And we come to serve him. So we gather together as servants. All of us picking up the towel that Jesus commanded us at the Last Supper. If you want to be the greatest among these people, follow me. Love one another as I have followed you. Pick up the towel and wash each other's feet. The greatest among you must be your doulos. Your doulos. Tiny word. Your slave. Are you up for this, people? Because this is, our, this, is our, this is how we live. We live as servants of the Lord. Servants of the Lord. Serving one another. Submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ. So when some of us have a problem with our brother or sister, we do our best to make sure that we are serving them, submitting to them. And that applies within marriage as well as outside marriage. We submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. The second call was a call to family. And this had two sides. Uh, on one side, I said last week that we are called to be a family in an increasingly strong way. I was talking to some people after the service, and there was a debate about whether it is accurate to call us a family. What do you think? Is it fair to describe this church a family? Or is family something that we are moving towards? Would you describe the people sitting around you, or perhaps behind you, or in front of you, or to the left, or to the right, as your family? Okay, here's another question. Do you know their names? Do you consider them your brothers and your sisters? Are they your family? Do you rely on them? Do you pray for them? Do you weep when they are weeping? And do you rejoice when they are rejoicing? Are we a family? Now, the call, I think, the call on God, from God, on us, is that we would be a family here in this place because there are families out there who are longing to know what family looks like. And we are called to be family, a family for the lonely and the broken and the, and the fatherless and the motherless, and to draw them into the reality that Tim was praying about when he prayed his prayer right from the back with such passion and enthusiasm and overran what was going on at the front. I've got to pray this prayer because God is our Father. Now, people are longing to know the reality of family life. Authentic family life. And we, apparently, have connection to the Father. And apparently, we are the ones who have become a new family that, when Jesus returns, will be the family. You with me on this? We need to live like a family now and draw resources from each other now. The other thing is that we need to reach out to families in this area. I did a bit of um, population study, I suppose, last week, demographics. We talked about how many people there were in, the, in, in Twerton. And, and basically, 70% of people are younger than me. Which means um, I should be respected from now on. 
because I am one of the elders of Twerton <laughs> in the top 30%. 70 percent of Twerton's population are younger than me. In other words, they're in families, either making them, being brought up in them, or exploring them. Now, of course, we don't stop being part of a family when you're my age. Still part of a family. But we have got to reach out to families. So we, I think the call on us as a church from God, the Father who made heaven and earth, because he loves Twerton, the 70% as well as the 30%, wants us to be shaped in such a way that we are good at connecting with families. You with me? Is there an amen in the house? There's a, you're not very Pentecostal, are you yet? This story I have told many times, but I've stopped telling it. But let me remind you of the calling of God upon my life, which started when I was running a family centre in inner city Bristol. Shamila was a young mum. Uh, she was Asian in origin, uh, and uh, although uh, not, uh, she didn't look, she come over as Asian, although she was very beautiful, I could tell that she had Asian roots in her. And uh, she had two beautiful sons, uh, one in her arms, just born, and another um, toddling around. And she came to our family centre brought by her community care worker. And she was completely withdrawn as a, as a person and as a mother. She hardly spoke, hardly communicated to her children, although she held them close to her. They were kind of like a security blanket, but she was, she, and she was invisible to everyone, really, even though she was so, so beautiful. And she came each week, she was brought, almost dragged by her community care worker into our family centre. And the idea was that she would come to the family centre in order to thaw, like a block of ice, that gradually over time she would thaw. And over months, we, we worked with her, we encouraged her. Hi, Shamila, how are you doing? How are the boys? Come in, let's do stuff together, let's play. Let's... And, and we gradually saw her, over time, begin to thaw a little bit, a smidgen. There was one day, the peak of, of my excitement came one day when I walked through the foyer, and we had a cafe in the centre of this family centre, a bit like Rose Cottage, a hubbub of activity and people and chaos. We called it Mrs. Noah's Kitchen. And we walked, I walked through Mrs. Noah's, because the lady was, who ran it looked like Mrs. Noah for some reason, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, had a family, she fed animals. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm getting off the part of the task. I was just reminiscing for a moment. Um, and I walked through, and there was Shamila sitting at a table on the side in the corner. I went, hi, Shamila, how are you? And for the first time, she looked me in the eyes, and she said, hi. It's OK, I'm not, I'm not too good today. But it didn't really matter what she said. It was the fact that this was the first time she had met my eyes. It was the first time we were actually having a conversation that went longer than my question. And I suddenly felt this. I went upstairs to the office. Having gone through the cafe, I thought, this is what it's about. It's about people coming into the family of God and somehow being a little bit transformed by grace. This is what it's about. I felt all excited. Two nights later, I was driving to a house group or something like that uh, uh, through fish ponds. And, uh, and I was going, well, just past East Eastern, by May Park School, went around the corner. And there on the corner, uh, where... Women who are working the street, prostitutes standing on the corner, I saw Shamila all over again. The same woman that I'd seen in my... Except for she was wearing different clothes. This time she was wearing... Well, you can imagine what she was wearing. I remember it as black and maybe short. Now, at that moment, I recognised that there was a huge backstory that I had not even touched, not become aware of, not really known. And suddenly all the thing about Shamila became clear to me that, that the bloke that came to pick her up sometimes may not have been her caring partner, but may have been someone who was her pimp in some way, or, it, or related to her some way through a, a relationship of, of abuse and, and, and dependence, and probably that she was on drugs. I mean, guaranteed she was on drugs. And, and, that, and that isolation had probably been abused in fact, guaranteed she'd been abused in some way in her past. 
And the, 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 the difficulty she was having with her children was probably huge. She had probably never been brought up in a family which had expressed themselves in the way that they should have done. So she was repeating all kinds of behavior with her children that maybe she had learned. Or maybe she was so scared, so small in herself right now because of all the abuse, all the men, all the people in her life that had done something to her that she had become invisible even to herself. And I worried from that moment on, I worried about their children. I worried who was looking after the two boys right now. I worried for the, and and of course, if you ever, I mean, all of us would be aware of of kind of child protection issues nowadays, because that's so evident in our minds. But I I was really anxious and I'd been trained as a social worker to to pay attention to these things. So I got straight on the phone when I got back home to to the community care worker who I had a relationship with. And I said, I've seen Shamila. We had a chat about this this aspect of her life. She was obviously cautious about telling me too much because it's confidential, but there was kind of issues about that. But it was important information to her. That was the last time I saw Shamila. She, she, I, I chatted to the community care worker again, but she had confronted her with the, with the reality of her working on the streets, and obviously this is not a good place for her to be with her. And so obviously a whole load of stuff had kicked in social services-wise, and she never came to the family centre again. But I tell you, that story changed my life. Why? Because I went home from that experience knowing that Shamila needed more than a family centre. She needed more than a creche. She needed more than a toddler group. She needed more than a few people who looked out for her. She needed more than a Sunday morning service. She needed more than hands in the air. She needed more than songs. She needed a family who were 100% rooting for her. She needed people who would be surrogate grandparents. She needed people who would give her enough resources. She needed people to rescue her from her community that she's currently living in and put her in another community that was stronger than the old one. You with me on this? She needed people who would do prayer ministry, who would connect her to the God of freedom and release her from some of the things that had been wounding her all the way through her life. She needed a people who were so committed to her that they would give everything to her. She needed what we would call a church. She needed church. And I went home to Tory and we started talking about what it would be like to be part of a church that was that committed. And we looked at ourselves and we looked at the great church that we were part of, the beautiful church that we were part of, and we wondered, are we ever going to be that church? And that was the seed for me wanting to put a collar around my neck. Not because I particularly want to have a collar around my neck, because I want, the reason I want to have a collar around my neck is so that I might be part of making a church into the kind of church where Shamilas routinely get rescued and find God. This will take every bit of our lives and energy. And we start from where we are, and we move towards becoming the bride of Christ. Are you with me on this? Wouldn't it be fantastic and aren't we seeing the fruit of our work in this way at the moment? It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a church to save a nation. My last thing, this is what I want to feel God is giving us at the moment and this is the call to connect. And there again, there are two things that we need to hear. There is a call to connect to God and there is a call to connect to each other. Now, anyone who's bright and sharp and on the ball will notice that these two fit very nicely with the two great commandments of Jesus, which is to love God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind, and to love your neighbour as yourself. So there is nothing new under the sun, but this is the call of God for us together, to connect with God and to connect with each other. There is this beautiful passage which Chris read out to us, which is perhaps one of my favourite passages in the whole of the New Testament because it describes the church that Shamila would be drawn into. They devoted themselves, look at this, the devoted, they devoted themselves, okay, on a scale between naught, not devoted, and ten, devoted, where are you? They devoted themselves to four things. Have you noticed the four things? Have you looked them up? Have you noticed them already? Have you read them and thought, yes, that's what I'm devoted for, that's my life. They're describing me. I woke you up then. They devoted themselves to number one. Apostles teaching number two. Look at the book. Don't look at me. It's up there. It's up there. Number one. 
And number two? Fellowship. Number three? Fellowship. And number four? Fellowship. Now, what would it be like? Why do they do this? Because they need the apostles' teaching. They didn't just sit and listen to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to following through on the apostles' teaching. They were disciples, remember? Go and make disciples, he said. Go into all the world, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Number one thing was they, they did was they devoted themselves to this one thing, this main thing of taking the word of God into their lives and making sure that they were doing it. For a house that will stand strong, even when the wind and the rain will come, is a house built on the word of God. Not just someone who says it, but someone who does it. Am I right? I nicked that from Jesus. Apostles' teaching to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. They weren't late. They weren't lazy. They weren't uncommitted. They weren't half-hearted. They were devoted. They were passionate to the fellowship, to the friendship, to the community, to the, to the, to the common bonds, to the unity, to making decisions together, to bearing with one another. They were devoted. They didn't want anything to break it up. If anything began to make any kind of waves amongst them, they began to get kind of anxious or there were, there were barriers or there were divisions. They were devoted to it. So they made sure that there was no division among them. They were devoted to the fellowship. They turned up. They met in each other's homes, as we will read. And to the breaking of bread. Why did they do this thing? Why did they do this thing? Because they knew that every time they did this thing, they would remember what Jesus had done for them and they would remember who they were. It was this great identity marker, like wearing a Chelsea shirt on the back of your, on your body and thinking, yes, I play for Chelsea, the best team. Well, the, one of the best teams. Mm, uh, a medium team at the moment. And lastly, to prayer. On the scale between naught and ten, are we the house of prayer that Jesus comes looking for? Or will he turn the tables on us when he returns? You with me on this? These guys, they were devoted to it. Everyone was filled with awe and the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Signs that the Spirit was living within them. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. Look at this. They sold property and possessions in order to give to those who had need. Not just small bags of food every now and again, but they sold houses and land and possessions. They didn't just sell, they didn't just have, give away what they had on the edge of what they had. They actually created wealth by selling cars, by selling houses, by, by, by going to a junk shop and getting rid of some furniture. In order, because there was someone in need within their community, there was a Shamila inside their community and they needed to respond. They lived in the kingdom. They had swapped mammon for God a long time ago. Are you with me on this? They sold everything. Every day, they cont- every day, flip me. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They went for the big and they went for the small. They loved the big thing where God was massive and the temple was huge. They loved it. And they went to the small, the fellowship, the small group. They committed themselves to both, the big and the small. On a scale between naught and ten, where are you? Are you devoted to the big and the small? And they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Um, When when it talks about breaking bread here, that's actually talking about having meals in each other's houses. When was the last time you had a meal with someone else in this family of yours that you are brother and sister to? Are you all coming to the family lunch today and sharing bread together with glad and sincere hearts? Or is this an interruption to your other families or your other friends? Are you a family? Are we a family? Are we meeting together as family? Are we this picture of Jesus, his body on earth, representing him to the world so that they might know what the kingdom looks like? This is our vision. This is where we're headed. Praising God and enjoying the favour of the people. Now look at the last line. And the Lord added to their number. Daily those who are being saved. Why? Why? Because they're magnetic. They were attractive. Who wouldn't want to be part of this family? A little later on, the writer to the Hebrews, whose name we don't know, writes this thing. Now, things have moved on. 
The early church that were so passionate, so devoted, have begun, to, they've got a bit flabby, they've got a bit woolly, they've, they've, they've kind of got a bit used to it. They've got used to the idea that Jesus saves them. And they were, turn up to worship, yeah, Jesus loves me, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I'm coming to communion, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's fine, yeah. And there were divisions between them and there were all kinds of issues and they got a bit sloppy in their worship and in their thinking. All kinds of things had happened. And, and this writer to the Hebrews, he says, remember, remember, remember that you have been brought in, rescued. And he's, he's a Jew, so he's using all the symbolism of the temple. He's talking about the, the building of the temple, using that imagery to help them. Now, for you who, who aren't Jewish, most of us, the temple was a bit like this. There was this bit and then there was that bit. And we all know that that bit is the holy place. Kids don't go there. And there was a curtain across this. And Jesus, or rather God for the Jew, Yahweh, was over there. And only the high priest could go over there. And Jesus rips open the curtain on the cross and opens access. And the Spirit is poured out on all people. And we have been drawn in. So he says this for brothers and sisters. Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body. He's talking about his body on the cross. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, not a vicar, but the great high priest through whom we have access to all things, all spiritual blessings are ours in Christ. Not through a charismatic leader, not through a priest, not through a church, but through Jesus. We only need Jesus to access all the things that we need in Christ for a holy life. Let us draw near to God. Let us draw near. Because the curtain is open, why would we sit out here? The curtain's open. The door's open. Come through. Connect with God. Don't stand on the fringe. Don't stand on the edge. Don't be in the temple courts, but come through. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled, remember the baptism last week, sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful to us, so let us be faithful to him. And let us consider how we may spur one another on. Encourage one another. What are we encouraging one another on to do? Towards love and good works. Come on, let's love. Come on, let's do some good. Come on, let's love. Come on, let's do some good. Or however you would spur someone on. I'm not quite sure. How would you spur someone on? Maybe not like that, actually. In fact, if everyone started doing that all the time, we, no one would come. Spurring one another. This is formation groups. This is house groups. This is spurring one another on. Why? Because we have access to the throne room of God. We have access to every spiritual blessing, but we get flabby. We need to work together. So he goes, not giving up meeting together. Why? Because meeting together is when you get to spur one another on. When you're not in the same room, you are not spurring each other on. Long pause. So when are we going to spur each other on? Because most of the time we're not in the same room. When are we going to spur one another on? We're going to have to meet together. So he says, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Really interesting. He doesn't say get into the habit of meeting together. He says some are in the habit of not meeting. And isn't that what it's like for us humans? That we get into a habit of not turning up? We get into the habit of not turning up on time. We get into the habit of turning up slightly lackadaisical. I'm not even sure what that word means. We get, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day of the Lord approaching, the day when Jesus returns. Now are you with me? The call is to connect to God and to each other. Why? Because we need each other. We cannot do this thing on our own because the task is too great. The battle is too much. We will fail unless we do this together. We will not win against the fiery darts of the enemy. We will not win against all the schemes of the roaring lion that waits prowling for us. We will not win against, against the powers and dominions of this dark age. We will not win unless we do this together and unless we do this with Jesus. Do you believe that? We're not playing at this. 
Shamila is held, Shamila and all the other Shamilas that she represents, is held by the grip of a power that is very, very strong indeed. There is a world out there whom we are touching, who we know about, of people who need rescuing from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We have the keys of eternal life. We have the truth. We have a life to offer people. Apparently, life in all its fullness. Apparently, we have all the spiritual resources given to us in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1. This is why we gather, so that we can be rooted again into the send into the uh, centre of God's love. Now, watch this video together. I I love uh, that. These are the words of the song that we may sing at the end. Come, set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, unveil why we're made. Come, set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize. To see the captive hearts released, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray, revive this earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. I'm up now. I'm up. I'm up now. This is my prayer. This is our prayer. I'm just going to switch this down over here so it doesn't make a nasty noise. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here, we pray. Unleash your kingdom's power reaching near and far. No force of hell can stop your beauty, your beauty changing lives. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. Why? We are your church. We, this, us, amazing, we, called by the living God who rose from the dead and is alive, sitting on the throne today. We are his church, his body, his bride. We are the hope on earth, not because of us, but because of Jesus. This is us. Are you still with me? Have you been exhausted by this talk so far? Yes. Our gatherings must have these things. We must connect to each other We must connect ourselves to God. Anything that doesn't, anything that prevents us from connecting to God or connecting to each other, whether we do it in services, whether we do it with buildings, whatever we do that prevents us from connecting to God is from the enemy. Anything in your heart, anything in the way you think, your attitudes that you bring with you, if it stops you connecting with God... (coughs) If you're stopping other people from connecting with God, if it's stopping you connecting to each other, we need to stop it. You with me on this? I'm deadly, deadly serious about this. That's why our services, our gatherings need to be authentic. This is this side, on this side of the line is about our connection with God. Our connection with God needs to be authentic. Don't do anything that you don't really believe. Don't say any words you don't really believe. If you don't believe you can give away all your life to God, don't sing a song that says you're going to give away all your life to God. However, don't come unwilling to be willing to give away your life to God. Come ready to be spirit-filled. We need our services to be full of the Spirit, to be rich, not because that's my name, but because we want it to have a feeling, a taste that is beautiful and rich and strong flavoursome and we need our services our gatherings to be transforming places where we are changed how many of us come I heard this story this week of someone who said they come and most weeks it's okay in fact they said this they said actually the majority of time I leave worse than when I arrive more stressed more anxious ouch Ouch. Ouch. The thing should be going in the opposite direction, shouldn't it? People sh- we should be coming to these things, going away refreshed and alive and transformed. We need to be touched by God. Allow God to touch and move you. 
So this is on this side of the line is about how we relate to each other. Our relationships need to be authentic. We need to be honest and truthful. We need to be honest. I'll say that again. We need to be honest and truthful with each other. Don't hide away now. You're in your masks again. We need to be honest and truthful, which means you can tell me that I'm going on too long. But it means far more than that. It means you can be honest and truthful about who you are, what God is doing in you, and what God is not doing in you. This is not a place for for facades or masquerading. This is a place of honesty. You with me on this? This gathering needs to be a place of welcoming. Too many people, too many people have come into our church and gone out of our building without truly being welcomed into the life that we have. It needs to have no cliques. Let me say that again, so you hear it. It needs to have no cliques. Now, we all know that this church has cliques. We have the clique that meets down this side, we have the clique that meets down this side, the clique at the back, the clique over there, we have the clique over there, we have the clique over there. Or maybe we're divided in other cliques of age, of background, of language. No, I will not stand for it because Jesus is the head of this church and he will not stand for a church that is divided. They were all devoted. They had everything in common. We are the church. Repent. If you are in a clique and you've excluded someone else, your brother or your sister, from belonging to you, repent. Welcome them. Draw them into you. You with me on this? There are no walls in our communication and in our family. <coughs> this place must be a place where all are welcome, of all abilities. Our most fervent and evangelistic worshipper is sitting at the front. Copy him. Imitate him. Imitate Angelos, our angel. Beautiful man. We are the church. Will you recommit to gathering in small groups, in formation groups, to this big thing. Let me say one more thing and you're going you're gonna to hate me for this but I've got all the time in the world because we're having lunch together now. <laughs> because this is important. We need to know that this building is going to change because these things are not our best friends at helping us to connect to God and to each other. <coughs> these things are not our best friends they help us in some ways, but they don't facilitate as much as we need it to. There's this guy, Richard Giles, who's an Anglican. You can see he's an Anglican. I put a picture of him up on the thing so you can see he's an Anglican. He's a proper Anglican. He's a real one. I went to hear him speak. First words that he started his talk, he wrote this book. He, 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 he said this, the things that shapes your church's worship more than anything else is the chairs. That was his starting point. The thing that shapes your church's worship more than anything else is the chairs. How you put the chairs out. In fact, he said two things. Chairs and coffee. Chairs and welcome. How people get welcomed and how the seats are set out will determine your church's worship. Let me show you some pictures of a Wesleyan chapel in Bristol. Anyone been there? You, you know what it looks like. It's designed for teaching. There's a massive pulpit, two-tier story building for teaching. Pulpit right in the middle. The communion is right at the front. There's no aisle in the middle. It's not designed for chat. They put boxes around people. Stop you chatting. You listen. This is the equivalent of PowerPoint in 1800. This is another church. This one is uh, 1909. This picture was taken. Now, can you see what's slap bang in the middle, right at the front? Slightly strange version of it. 
but there is a massive pulpit right in the middle with this really strange kind of, kind of maybe that helped the, the sound project, but can you see how many people there are would have filled this thing? Now, the whole building is designed for one thing, so that the person who's in the middle when they're preaching can be heard and seen. Here is a cathedral in Philadelphia. This is where Richard Giles went. When he went uh, as a priest, there were pews all the way around. It was a dark building. It was dark on the outside, it was smoky, and it was dark on the inside. This is what it looks like today. Can you see what it's done? He's opened up this space. He's put the symbols of baptism, of communion, and of teaching in the centre rather than at the front. The community are invited to gather around these key elements of a gathering. They face each other like we do up the front. Rather than you facing me, they face each other. It changes the way they feel. He's brightened up the building. He's put arts on the wall. He's changed the chairs. He's improved the lighting. They had a baptism. They had a font right long way away. They brought it down to the middle and they included an adult baptistry alongside the infant baptistry with water pouring from one to the other, symbolising the life of God from one to the other and that these things are united, these things are one. And here is a group of people gathered around the baptism, standing around it. Here is, here is something that is not a worship service. There's four people playing some beautiful music in the middle of this. But just look at this picture. What does it tell us? People are enjoying it. They're intimate. They are gathered around the centre. They're focused in. But there are also some people sitting on a mat. There's a little bit more informal. And then there's a few people sitting on some steps. And then there's one sitting on a mat up here. And there's even Mark Lawrence standing at the back there walking around. Excuse me taking... Oh, he didn't even hear, so that's all right. Can you get me? People are in this space, it's open, it's breathing. They're connected, but they're doing many things all at once. Here is another setup of the same building. Different day, different service, different meanings, different experience, different presence of God. Here is another church that he then went on to in Huddersfield. This church was in an inner city estate on the edge of, oh, outer estate, on the edge of Huddersfield, difficult place. And again, he did the same thing there, drew people around the centre of the table. Here is a church in London, St Mary's, in Ealing. This is what it looked like when the Victorians built it, beautiful Victorian premises, carved with metal and wood so that everyone would pay attention. And this is what it looks like today, with pews that have been moved, that are movable around the middle space. There's still the beauty, there's still the, the essence that the building had, but it's now been changed and transformed, become more accessible to people for different things. Here are the different ways they set up the table and chairs sometimes. Can you see how that would change, how you felt, depending which service you came to? This building does one thing. It does one thing. Could it possibly be opened up to do more than one thing? Here is a group of people in the same church building gathered around the table. See the movement, see the ages. There are grey heads and there are young children and there are teenage boys in this picture. They're all gathered around, milling around the Lord's table. It's a beautiful image, isn't it? Here is the same space, but now at night time with some young people that have laid out something in the middle of the space and they've lit candles that spell out words and you can't see them in this picture, but they're sitting around on bean bags around the edge, exploring God, connecting with God and one another. Here is the same space on another night and this time you see middle-aged people, at least if you could see the picture in the way that I did, you'd see that all the people, they're not, they're not the young people, they're the middle-aged people, but here they are representing Moses with the burning bush in the centre. They've all taken off their shoes in a slightly embarrassed way and left them by the fire because they are on holy ground and they're all connecting to this story once again. Paul Hobbs. Paul Hobbs. On holy ground. Here, thank you. Here is another building, a traditional Anglican building. This is what it looked like before. This looks a bit like our building. And here is a building, the same building. And what have they done? They've done the two things. They've created an open space and they've put some kitchen area in the back corner in order to do the two things that will shape their worship more than anything else. They're welcome. 
and their seating. Here is Chartres Cathedral. You can't get more posh church than that. More proper church than Chartres Cathedral in France. The designers of Chartres Cathedral designed it without chairs. And so they put a marker on the middle of the floor called a labyrinth. Have you ever heard about this? And the idea was the labyrinth, you'd use this walk way as a way of getting closer to God. As you got closer to the centre, you would walk your pilgrim way closer to the heart of God. Here is people doing exactly that one, one, one weekday, Wednesday in Chartres Cathedral. And here is another church where they have got enough space to put the same labyrinth on their floor and do the same thing and not travel to France in order to do it. Here is a United Reformed Church. And you can see the centre point of this church when it was originally built was the organ, right slap bang in the middle. This was in the heydays of organs. This is when the organ was, was everything, everything you needed. So it's right in the middle and everything would have pointed towards it. And what have they done? They've changed that around. They've turned it sideways. They've got the space and capacity to face the front, but they can also turn sideways. And they've, they've changed the atmosphere of the place by changing the colour of the place. Can you see how light and bright it is? Here is the same church, slightly more subtle lighting. And of course, there are other spaces in church buildings too that can be changed. You can see that they've reordered the church in the background through the windows down there. But this is in the eaves, up, right up high. And they've created what I think is probably an ideal place for a crash. If you imagine if you had little kids and you were participating in the, in the life of the church, you could hear what the church is going, you could visually see what's going on. Your kids could even look through the window, look down on what's going on. You'd feel connected instead of in a room far away, never to be seen or heard. This is good design. It helps people connect with God and connect with each other. And here is a beautiful space with two very beautiful, lovely, well-behaved children in. But this is, this is a space with shelving around the edge and godly play materials really beautifully laid out so that the children can explore the stories of God in their own way, at their own pace, learning what it is to follow this Jesus. And what a beautiful way to use a window to make it the place where the children meet. We are called to use our buildings to connect with each other and with God. And over the next year, we as a church will be exploring how we can open up this space. Decisions haven't been made. We haven't raised any money. We haven't, we've got to get loads of permissions and all that sort of thing. But I'm calling you, I'm calling you to make the decision to opt into this and not to think of 10 reasons not to do it, but to think of the best way of doing it. You with me on this? Some of you, I know, we've been having chats already, discussions already that are behind the scenes about this already, and I know it brings up all kinds of emotional feelings for us, and, and of course we are sensitive to those things. These things are massive for us. But I believe that this is our time. It's our time to do something else in this place, in this building. St. Michael's is all generations, all abilities, some wounded, some grieving. We are a family called to connect to each other, called to love and to serve. This is what it's about. Where do we want to be in 10 years' time? We want to be more of what we are, more connected, more alive with the Spirit. We're going to serve one another out of reverence from Christ. This is the attitude we're going to bring. We're going to be a family. This is the way we will live. And we're going to connect. We're going to love God and we're going to love our neighbour. And every bit of our lives will be poured into this, this goal. We will make the main thing the main thing.